What would you do if you found out that your child had a heart defect and needed surgery ASAP? My guest today knows this situation only too well. Hear about her and her family's journey and how their story is providing amazing support for families all over the world in this episode of the Mind, Body and Soul podcast with John Morris. Welcome to the Mind, Body and Soul podcast with John Morris. Inspiring, motivating and educating you in finding balance in the craziness of day-to-day life. Learn from and listen to a man who has a wealth of life experience, from business to bodybuilding, artist to author, and has learned to deal with his own physical and mental wellness. But that's not all. Each week, John interviews and picks the minds of special guests from all around the world and from all walks of life, from actors to authors, wrestlers to warriors, business owners to life coaches, and so much more. Welcome to today's episode of the Mind, Body, and Soul podcast with John Morris. Okay, folks, well, welcome to another exciting episode of the Mind, Body, and Soul podcast. We are here in the studio very early this morning. We're bringing you this show that helps you find balance through inspirational, motivational, educational content on your journey to find balance in the craziness of day-to-day life. And here today in particular, with the presidential elections going on, there is a really, really crazy, crazy time period going on. But that aside, I'm really excited. I am, as always, your host, John Morris, and today... I'm really excited because we're doing this show early because this is coming to you all the way with our guest from Hawaii. Uh, My guest today is a wonderful, wonderful life coach. Like I said, she resides all the way in Hawaii. Uh, She is an HLHS, and that's hard to get, (laughs) that's hard for me to say, folks, Uh, a hypoplastic left heart syndrome advocate, which is a birth defect that affects uh, the normal blood flow around the heart and accounts for about one to two percent of all congenital disease. So it is quite a rare thing. Um, she specializes in helping people in relationships and also those who suffer with heart defects, a bundle of energy and a mother to three amazing kids. Um, and I want you to welcome the awesome, wonderful and always lovely Courtney Gibbon. Courtney, welcome to the show. How are you doing today? Thank you so much. That intro was very lovely. <laughs> it made me feel very fancy. <laughs> well, that's always the way. We always want to get our, our guests over and, and really, you know, excel all the awesome things that you've got going for you. Courtney, for, for our audience that maybe haven't met you before, um, share with us a little bit about yourself and what it is that you do. Yeah, that's a great question. I am first a human. I always like to separate my humanness from my motherhood and being a wife. But yeah, I'm a mom to three little girls and I am married. And um, outside of motherhood and marriage, I am a life coach. And I'm really passionate about relationships and forgiveness and helping people with difficult relationships in their lives. And outside of that, I sometimes do yoga and I love donuts. You and my wife would get on really, really well because she loves donuts as well. Are you a, are you just a standard donut girl or are you a jam donut or a custard donut? Um, Southern California donuts are my favorite. I can't find anything that's just like a chocolate bar from Southern <laughs> California. I don't know. It hits different. <laughs> Fantastic. I wanted to ask you as well, right off the, off the, the bat, I suppose, talk to us a little bit about your early life. Sure. Yeah. So my parents separated when I was four years old. Um, my dad was an alcoholic, he had a bad temper, and they separated. Um, he's been an alcoholic my whole life. And my mom had me and my siblings with her. I grew up pretty poor lights turned off, food scarcity. And I remember sometimes just eating like pancake mix with water for like a few days at a time. Um, Yeah, like I also though, at the same time, remember my childhood being really happy and fun because as a child, you experience so many, you know, I didn't know how poor we were a lot of the time. And so we went on adventures with my dad to the park and we got to experience, you know, love for my parents but they also had some of their own problems and when I was 12 years old my mom became addicted to meth and um that was kind of the start of a lot of 
problems for me. I had to move out at 14 and I just saw the path she was going down and my dad wasn't an option. So I ended up living with some friends um, for a few years through high school and I moved out on my own when I was 18. Wow. I mean, that that's a lot. And, you know, in a lot of ways, unfortunately, I can identify with, with a lot of your journey, not to that extent, though. Um, alcoholism or any form of addiction when it grabs hold of a person is it's crippling both for the person but oftentimes it's more crippling for the people that are watching on um, you know again you and sometimes we don't know where the conversations are going to go what can you remember in in your early life about how you were processing these things what kind of effect did that have on you when I was younger, I didn't really understand addiction. And I guess I didn't even understand addiction mm -hmm. even until like my adulthood, because like you said, it affects us so differently. And it's really confusing for mm -hmm. people on the outside because it seems pretty simple. Just stop doing whatever you're doing. Just stop being addicted. <laughs> and my parents had a lot of personal traumas. And um, as a child, I, I didn't have that kind of knowledge. So I remember like lecturing my dad to stop drinking and being really embarrassed of him because he was always kind of a little drunk yeah. and it was really hard to feel like confident in introducing my dad to anybody um so yeah I remember in fifth grade I like he was at a cheerleading um event like a football game that I was a cheerleader at and my dad came up to me after the event I turned at him and I saw that he was drunk and I just looked at him and walked away and a friend of mine was like that's so rude that's your dad and I just I felt awful, but I felt yeah. so embarrassed at the same time. And it's just so hard to navigate those things as a child. I can imagine. I can imagine. And, uh, you know, and, and it is. And I think it does a lot to us psychologically as well, because like you say, you know, you, you don't want to invite people around because you never know how folks are going to be or how they're going to behave. And then, you know, parents may say, well, that doesn't reflect on you. But the reality is it does. And, uh, you know, it's certainly a difficult thing to go through. I normally don't ask this question so early on in the show, but I think for, for, for you, you get, you get the privilege of this one. <laughs> what were some of the hardest battles that you had to face um, and that you had to go through um, in, in your journey? Probably with my mom, because she was more stable in my younger um, age, my childhood, um, adolescence, the younger part of my childhood. She mm -hmm. was like, the more stable one, the one I knew I could rely on. And as I grew older, she became less and less reliable. And it was really hard to not have, it was one thing to have my dad where I only saw on weekends be a little unstable, but to also have my mom not be reliable and be unstable. It just felt like, so like my, the ground beneath me was kind of being shaken and lost and moving into my friend's houses, like lit, sleeping on couches and like, I met some people through church that I babysat for and like I stayed with them for a year and a half and I got to experience so much love from other people but it was still hard yeah. living with people who were not my family yeah. and not being able to again feel confident in introducing my family or even knowing if my mom was ever going to be around for any special events mm -hmm. and so it was really a struggle to be happy around my mom and I, I became very very resentful mm -hmm. and I really just kind of packed all of those emotions away yeah. I just kind of packed it up all the emotional baggage I just kind of kept shoving it down and it just was festering like just a lot of resentment towards my mom a lot of hard feelings towards my dad and I didn't like admit it to myself because I just wanted to move on with my life yeah. I just wanted to keep moving forward you know just get through it but I didn't. I just kept shoving it down. <laughs> and, and and we talk about that. And that there was a, a lady that had told me years ago, again, but very similar story to yours, you know, that feelings buried alive never die. And I know in my own, you know, my own life, I'm not very good with dealing with uh, serious hurt. And obviously, we, we talk about the serious hurt and the levels of hurt and everything. I'm sure we'll, we'll, we'll unpack this a little bit. But, you know, if, if, if it's, you know, a minor thing that's happened, you can get over that pretty quickly. But the deep hurts of life, for me, sometimes have taken years to actually get through and process because it is a process. It is a journey. It's not just a, a light switch that people can flick on and off. Um, 
what was that like for you at that point? Obviously, you're a teenager. You, you know, you, you've gone through these things. You know, your your folks are dealing with their own issues for whatever reason, and there's always a reason behind mm -hmm. people getting addicted to drugs, alcohol, you know, whatever it might be. Um, sometimes it's just that people just can't cope and they they just can't function. But obviously, for you having to see this, how did that really affect your mindset um, going forward? Well, I feel like I was mostly fine until I was around my family and I just had zero patience. I wasn't who I wanted to be. I just was short. I was snappy. I just would yell at my mom. It was really hard to have a conversation with her. And then simultaneously, I wanted to be around her. I wanted a connection with my mother. I wanted her to, you know, take care of me and do the things that mothers do that I saw my friends have. And so it was this combination of this pain that I never really confronted and also this like desire to be close with her and cultivate a relationship and the two constantly clashed and yeah. I felt really conflicted um, because I ignored both parts like the desire to have a relationship and also just this pain that was always associated with her yeah. and mostly because I just wanted her to change I just yeah. knew that if she got her life together it would just be so much more simple for me I would feel better and she would be better off and everything would work out if she could just figure her life out yeah. it, it is I mean it's one of the hardest things for some people to actually admit hey I've, I've got a problem others it isn't others are quite happy to say I've got a problem I'm aware that I've got a problem but then it's obviously dealing with the, the steps to get sober or get free or, or you know whatever language you want to use what were your, some of your mindsets and passions around this time? Because obviously now you, you, you're aware, you know, like myself, you know, you, you've got to do this. You know, you, you maybe not have the, um, the backing of a mom and dad that everybody else seems to have. What was it like for you? And, and you know, that point where you're saying, OK, I've got to decide what I want to do with my life. I've got to really focus on this. What were some of your mindset and passions? I think I was taking pride in not being like my family. I was, I considered myself kind of the odd man out to begin with, a little different. And so it was nice to see me succeeding. Like I lived on my own, I had a job and I had a good friend group. And so I just saw myself as like a little more successful. And I was proud of that. Like I was proud that I could be a little bit, you know, apart from my family. Um, I also like felt that my past shouldn't make me bitter. Like I was like, I just need to be better and I need to not let it be, make me bitter. I kind of only felt that way logically, like yeah. kind of on the shallow end. I didn't really dive into that wholeheartedly at the moment because I still carried a lot of bitterness. I just yeah. wouldn't recognize it at the yeah. time. Um, but yeah, I just focused on myself and I tried to go to school and, um, it was the first time I had like a consistent income in my life. So it was just nice to be independent and be a little 18 year old. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's true. I mean, I, I totally get what you're saying because it's, it is the strangest thing in the world. And anybody that's obviously had this will, will resonate with what I'm about to say. When you're born into a family and, you know, how can I put this? You're nothing like your mom and dad in terms of your interests, in terms of your, you know, abilities. I was into bodybuilding. My dad was into bowling and snooker. You know, I was into <laughs> to weightlifting and wrestling. He was into, you know, dominoes and, and, and you know, billiards and whatever else. We, we couldn't have been more polar opposites. Um, and yet, you know, now, you know, we, we've got a, a relationship where we talk and, and everything, which is good. But it's the strangest thing that, you know, it's like, okay, I'm in this family and your family really want you to be a part of everything that they're doing, but you're like, I'm not, I'm not them, <laughs> I'm completely opposite. So I completely get it. I've got to ask as well, you know, and, and again, I know we're probably going to flit around a little bit here. Um, what job was you working at, at the, uh, that was completely grammatically incorrect. What job did you have um, at the time when you were 18 years old? So yeah, I had a bunch of random jobs. I worked in restaurants. I was a nanny part-time. I did like secretarial work. And then I became a dental assistant for a year. Right. Um, I just kind of fluttered around so that I could make ends meet. But at the time it was like all I needed and I was going to school to full time. So it was just like, I, yeah, I just really enjoyed being independent and having a disposable income and not having a large amount of bills to pay. Yeah. It was just so nice. <laughs> <laughs> and, it, and it's such a wonderful thing. Obviously, you know, the more success that you have, sometimes the more bills come with it as well. 
I've got to ask, what drew you into working, learning, and studying about heart defects? Okay, so yeah, that's honestly where a lot of my mindset shifts happen because okay. for a long time, like I met my husband, we dated, we got married, we started having kids pretty quickly after that. And I became even more resentful of my parents, honestly. Yeah. After I had children, I was like, wait, so you have children and you love them this much and you still chose the things you did. Mm -hmm. It was really difficult for me to accept that they had babies yeah. and loved them. Assume it, like, I assumed they loved me as much mm -hmm. as I loved my own daughter. And I just was like, this is nonsense. Like, how could you ever do anything? I felt abandoned by my mom a lot. And so I had to start setting really serious boundaries with her. I stopped talking to her for a long period of time because I just had to protect myself. And looking back again, it was more just kind of not confronting emotions, stuffing those kinds of things down. And then I had taken a break from school my husband got an opportunity to go back to school. He had taken a break. We were kind of over going to school, had kids young. So, um, but he got an opportunity to go back to school. So we moved to Hawaii for school. And shortly after that, we arrived here in Hawaii and we got pregnant again with our second child. And we found out that she had a very serious heart defect called hypoplastic left heart syndrome. And I was just everything. I was like, wait, no, like, I've already been through the hard stuff. My childhood was hard. I don't get any more hard things. Like I kind of felt ripped off by the universe. I was like, yeah. no, this is not how it's supposed to work. And I felt kind of like useless. I felt like anything that I'd ever learned about like making it through hard things yeah. didn't matter anymore because I had nothing. I didn't feel like I had really any set of tools mm -hmm. to do anything with. Um, and so my daughter's heart defect is about um, the left side of her heart is severely underdeveloped um, and it requires three open heart surgeries. She's had three already, but one was an emergency one. And she's going to have her third required heart surgery in the beginning of the next year. Um, but during the first nine months of her life, we had to move back to California to save her life. Mm -hmm. um, go to a hospital there that was capable of handling her severity. And it was really then where I was like grappling with my mental health in terms of just being able to have hope and, you know, beyond like a motivational yeah. quote or an inspirational thing. I really struggled with trying to, I don't know, everything about my mindset was just, yeah. I think a lot of things from my past were coming up and I just started learning about psychology more I started really thinking about my own thoughts and my own beliefs what I was thinking about myself and my daughter and my situation and it really changed how I looked at all of my hard things I want to ask you as well because you, you unpack you know so many things there and there's a lot of us to talk about you know when, when we're talking about protecting ourselves you know and again it was it was a teaching that I was taught years ago by a man much wiser than I am um you know who said you know you've got to set those boundaries so you did the right thing um in my opinion and you have to protect your own self because again if you're giving 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 all the time uh all of your energy to these what, what i call energy vampires or you know suckers or, or whatever it is you know it just drains you um and plus like you said you know you were about to start a journey with your daughter and and being a mother um, you know, that is, it's, it's a massive thing. And I think sometimes people downplay it a lot. Plus, you know, you guys are going to school, you're still studying and everything that's there, you know, and moving. There's a lot of adjustment going on in your life at that time, you know, and uh, it's it's no wonder, I think in some ways that your mind is is having these issues like you were saying, and then top that obviously with, with your daughter's, uh, you know, heart defects and things. I've got to ask you, um, uh, because this is the only opportunity I've had to talk to someone about this. Where was it that you found out uh, that your daughter's going to have this heart defect? Was it during pregnancy or was it was she, was she, when she was born? It was during pregnancy. So I went in for the routine anatomy scan. And usually that's when people find out the gender and want to talk about that. But really the focus for that um, ultrasound is looking at the growth and yeah. all the organs. And that was when it was taking extra long and they said, we see something on the heart and I need to talk to a doctor. 
I, I want to ask you, because we, we do a thing, uh, it's almost called freeze frame. It seems to be a, a thing at the moment where it's almost like you hone into a person's journey. And this, this I think, is, is, is as good as a you know, place to talk about to really help people understand you're having the scan. You're, you know, they're waiting and, you know, the doctors are taking longer. They then come to you and say, we need to talk to a doctor and the doctor's coming in talking to you. Now, you're a pregnant mom uh, or mother-to-be what's going through your head in that moment when they say to you, you your daughter's going to have you know this hl hs um so i love coping with humor <laughs> and <laughs> it's a sick thing but it keeps me sane most of yeah. the time so the ultras do you your son or daughter struggle with direction clarity and purpose maybe you struggle with anxiety maybe you struggle with self-esteem or confidence issues maybe you've got great ideas but you've no idea how to get from where you are to where you want to be don't worry you're not alone people around the world struggle with these issues hi there i'm john morris i'm the coach to the creative mind and i'm also a psychologist in training for the last two decades i've worked with people from all walks of life and all over the world all with a wide variety of issues i've worked with people from youth groups to adult education to people dealing with day-to-day -day living issues and each one of them has an amazing story to tell and we've helped them get clear as to where they are and clear as to where they want to be and I want to help you too. Unlike a lot of life coaches and therapists that like to drag things on and leave you dangling on the carrot I want to make sure that each and every single time that we meet and have a life coaching session together that you never ever leave saying man that was a waste of time or I didn't get the value that I desired I am committed to making sure that each and every single time we meet you are one step closer by the time we finish to a goal that you have in mind so why should you work with me well let me tell you as I said I'm committed to making sure that I provide value that I provide something that's step-by-step step and easy to follow I'm also a fantastic listener I've been blessed with the gift of listening and I love to listen to people their stories their their dreams their desires because there's nothing more energetic and passionate to me than when a client gets their first desire or they get that goal or they hit that big target or whatever it might be and also as the trifecta, I am committed to you to helping you take action. So whether or not it be deciding on the university you want to go to, deciding on the course that you want to be at, helping you get excited and passionate about your work environment, whatever it might be, I am committed to helping that happen. I'm also committed if you need to shed some pounds, if you need to gain some muscle mass, if you need to, I don't know, develop your self-esteem, I'm committed to helping you take action and following a step-by-step plan of action that we can put together. But now folks, I want to tell you about the Early Bird Special Offer that we are launching right now. It is for 10 people and 10 people alone. That's right, if you are interested in having life coaching sessions with me one-on-one, -on -one, 10 people have the opportunity to do that and we're looking to help these people change their lives completely. We take ages 14 and upwards, so if you're interested in learning how to get from where you are to where you want to be, to really develop that passion to live a life that you enjoy as opposed to a life that you wake up and think, ah, you know, how to develop and change your mindset from maybe a negative one to a positive one, understanding what fuels your mindset and understanding what creates the kind of life that you want to live, then get in touch with me today. I would love to hear from you. As I say, this is open only for 10 people and once it's done, it's done. So click that box below, get in touch, let's have a conversation backwards and forwards and see if we're a fit for each other and I look forward to working with you. Have an amazing day. Hey folks, take care, God bless, and I will see you soon. Sound tech leaves the room after saying this to us, like, I need to go talk to a doctor. And I look at my husband and I say, well, you know, worst case scenario, the, the baby needs a heart transplant. Best case scenario, it's fine. And he goes, I think she's just bad at her job. So <laughs> we're just kind of like awkwardly making these terrible yeah. jokes. And then three doctors walk in and confirm that it was hypoplastic left heart wow. syndrome. And... We were just devastated. It was awful. And then they said, and the baby will need a heart transplant eventually. <laughs> and we were just like, it was just, yeah, there's nothing to prepare you for that yeah. moment. And honestly, diagnosis day is probably worse than surgery day mm -hmm. because of how much fear you have. You just have no answers. Yeah. You are completely shocked. You have like nothing to like grasp onto except this like one diagnosis yeah. your mind is racing and it is more scary on diagnosis day than 
the other days I've experienced. And it's like top two. First one was when she almost died in the hospital, but the second one is diagnosis day because of how terrifying it feels to get just a diagnosis that you have to research and have so many questions about, and there's so many appointments ahead of you. And it's just, it's, yeah, it's devastating. Of course. And, and to, to put people in the picture here uh, from the research that I did, and obviously Courtney, you'll be able to, to, to confirm or deny this, you know, it, it, it is a very rare thing in the grand scheme of things that in the United States in particular, it affects maybe one or two in every 400, uh, 4,300 uh, 4, uh, babies. It is you know, a very, yeah. very rare thing. Um, you know, and, and again, you know, you, you've got to remember folks that Courtney's dealing with all these other issues that are going on. And then she gets told, you know, your daughter's going to have, you know, she's gonna need a heart transplant. She's gonna have HLHS. Um, it, it's not going to be as smooth and as steady as, as you hoped, you know, and, and it's, it's no wonder why that sent your, you know, mind into, you know, tailspin kind of. How were things for you after you leave the, the hospital after getting that news? Because I, I can't even imagine what that would be like. Yeah, I think I just felt numb. Mm -hmm. I, I think that mostly through my childhood and through high school, no one would have known about anything in my family. Yeah. Like I, was very optimistic. I was a joyful kid. I was very involved in high school. A lot of people didn't know about my family life and I liked it that way. Yeah. It wasn't that I was super private. I, if people started asking me, I was pretty open, but I just, optimism got me through. Yeah. And then this hit and it was like the shallow optimism that I relied on in yeah. high school and as a young adult did no, nothing for me. And it was like, I just felt numb. I just felt so hollow inside. Mm -hmm. I cried until I couldn't cry anymore and I kept googling things until I felt like okay this is the worst I can do I need to stop <laughs> googling things um yeah it was just overwhelming yeah it, it and it's understandable you know and, and the, the crazy thing is with the human brain that you know it, it can deal with so many things that go on but when it's pushed past that point um, you know, literally, like you say, it, it becomes numb. I experienced that when I was in America and my best friend betrayed me and I came back and I was basically dumped in a, in a bed sit and you're looking around and you're thinking, oh my goodness, you know, this is, you know, how do I cope with this? My life is all over the place because my mind was already fragile as it is. Completely different scenario, but these things, you know, the, the brain can still um, respond to trauma in very, very different ways. Um, and, and, you know, obviously it, it can take a long time, folks, for, for the, the trauma to, you know, to, you, you're never the same, but it takes a long, long, long time for the trauma to work through you. Um, how was the rest of the pregnancy for, for you guys? And then obviously going through this and knowing, you know, uh, you know, what's to come kind of thing. Yeah, I think it was the weirdest thing is that knowing that we had like this big thing happening yeah. in the future, but knowing that she was going to be fine, mostly in my womb, yeah. like <laughs> as long as I was pregnant and getting my regular checkups, like she was okay and yeah. safe. And so we were okay, but we were also like really sad and sometimes like dreading this like new chapter of our lives. And it was this weird feeling of like being so excited to have a new baby, but also dread her birth. and. Yeah. um. So yeah, it was just trying to juggle both hope and yeah. also being okay with knowing that things could not go the way we want them to. Yeah. And just trying to be realistic because mm -hmm. I did have a lot of people tell me that I needed to pray for healing or, you know, or just like, I don't know, lots of different things that yeah. I felt were not helpful for me because I just felt like, okay, what are the realistic statistics? Yeah. What is that I want to happen? And where do we go from there? And I felt like that kind of mindset really helped me just get through my pregnancy and connect with my baby and look forward to seeing her face. And I just knew like, I just wanted to see her face. And then whatever happened afterwards was going to happen regardless. It, it's a really interesting thing what you said there, because sometimes, and we've covered this so many times, you know, from, from you know, all different illnesses and things, um, people oftentimes just don't know what to say. So they, they say the thing that comes natural, or you need to pray, or you need to do this, you need to do that. And what you probably needed to hear at that point was, I don't have a clue what to say, but I need you to know that I'm here. And that's folks, yeah. sometimes the best thing that you can do is don't give the whole party line spiel. I know you may believe it, 
I've been there. I've probably done the same things, but you know, the greatest thing you can ever do for somebody else is just to say, look, it sucks right now. We're aware of the realities, but you know, we're, we're, we're here for you. Um, and that's that I'm sure that would have made all the difference to you as well, knowing that you had, you know, that, that support that really understood, you know, what, what you were going through. 100%. Absolutely. Um, obviously now she's on her second, oh no, she's on her third heart surgery now. Um, and obviously one more to come. How are you guys with things now? Yeah. So I feel like I was struggling the most. Um, there were a few months when she was six months old that my okay. husband and I lived apart. Right. He needed to finish some specific classes for his degree and he couldn't lose his spot at, at the university. Oh. So he went back with our oldest daughter and we lived apart for three months. And that was probably the hardest time. Um, I was struggling a lot of her medical needs and I was alone. Yeah. And she was immune compromised. So I couldn't really take her out or be outside a lot with a bunch of people yeah. pre COVID days when no one wore masks. <laughs> but um, yeah, so I, at that point was when I was like, one day I just woke up and I was like, I need motivation. I need like excitement because I'm feeling low and unmotivated. And I remember just like typing into YouTube, like motivational videos, because I just wanted to feel motivated. And that kind of led me down to some more personal development Mm -hmm. podcasts, some more um, psychology stuff. And I just started studying about my mindset. And I started learning about emotions and how to feel them. And all of a sudden, all these other things are coming up. And it wasn't just so much about my daughter's heart defect anymore. It was about me as a person. And all these things came up that I just didn't even realize that I was thinking about myself. And I, yeah, I guess now I see um, her heart defect as just part of who she is. And I think something that's kind of common in the CHD community is like villainizing the defect Mm -hmm. and making it like separate from Mm -hmm. the child, which I understand why we do that. But for me, there is no other life. There's no version of life that my daughter Zola lives in without her heart defect. So for me, it's just, this is a part of who she is. And whether that means she lives until she's, you know, a hundred years old yeah. or 50 years old or five years old, the heart defect is a part of who she is. And that's how she came. And that's how she came. Yeah. So I'm not going to try to argue with reality in that aspect. And when I stopped trying to argue with reality, it changed so much of my perspective within my marriage, within myself and with my parents. And it's so weird that my daughter's heart defect led me to the path to forgive my parents, but that's how it happened. It's one of the crazy things, you know, that, that sometimes we have to go through things that really absolutely suck. And, uh, you know, what I call valley times, because, you know, it just feels like, are we ever going to get through this? Is this ever going to happen? Is anything ever going to be bright and happy again? You know, we don't want to downplay, you know, the, the, the feelings of these valley times. But equally, like you said, you know, when when you start to look back and, and you know, hindsight's a wonderful thing, you can say, well, this, this, and this led to obviously, you know, forgiveness and, and, and moving on. Talk to us a little bit, you know, more about how your perspective really changed when, you know, you started to study more about the mindset, about motivation, about yourself as a person. Yeah. So I even switched my major in at my university because okay. I was so fascinated by um, human behavior and conflict. And I feel like we all have one family member or maybe even a couple family members that are just so freaking difficult to get along with or we want to right we want to have a relationship with but then they just just really annoy the heck out of us and um and that's like the mild version right for me I like literally hated my parents I hated my mom and I don't say that with pride it's obviously embarrassing but that's how I was and I think no one talks about it because it's like awkward to just say oh yeah I hate my mom like but when you live with resentment and anger and just like pure hatred for years and you don't deal with it you it turns into hatred and you just don't know what to do with it and you get really you start shaming yourself and you're telling yourself that you're not a good person because you hate your family member but then your feelings are valid because they hurt you so it's this just this cycle constantly of you're going around 
And so through this process of forgiving my parents, I came up with my forgiveness program and I created the five myths of forgiveness because for me, I didn't want to forgive my mom because I felt jaded. I felt like I was going to lose something. And so I started documenting my journey. I started like really writing down the process of what was going to happen if I forgave her. And I combined all this stuff to the five things I call the five myths of forgiveness. Okay. Um, the first one is that forgiveness is not, or is only for the other person. And that's how I grew up learning about forgiveness. Like it's something that you sacrifice. Like you need to forgive other people because it's the right thing to do. And you need to give this forgiveness to other people. And I realized that wasn't true because really the one person that would benefit the most from forgiving my mom was me. Like I would be yeah. the one that would feel better. I would be the one that would be able to um, get all the benefits from feeling better and being able to think differently about my mom and behave differently around her. And so it was a win-win in that scenario. Um, the second myth is that the other person has to change and pretty much nothing in my mom's situation has changed like 15 years later now. And I, I still forgive her. And I, I spent years of my life, literally 14, 13 years of my life telling myself that she had to change yeah. for me to have a good relationship with her. And I just was miserable because of that. And so I changed my definition of what a forgiveness or what a good relationship looks like, first of all. Mm -hmm. um, but also that I just dropped that entirely because they don't have to change. And I also thought that if I forgave her that I just, number three is that like forgiveness means approval. Like I thought, yep, if I forgive her, it means I approve of everything she's ever done to me or anything my dad has done or all of the mistakes they made were just fine. I didn't want to give them that, right? I didn't want to give them and concede to their behavior. But I realized that accepting their behavior is not indifference. It doesn't mean that you are complacent or you just agree with everything they do. It really allows you to acknowledge your pain and to be certain that you can move forward yourself. And it really impacted me to just allow them to be who they were while still being able to take care of myself yeah. um yeah so that was a really big one when I could get over that I was like okay I'm making some progress here mm -hmm. um number four is that nothing changes and this was a huge one for me um I just thought okay maybe forgiveness is for me maybe it's for myself and my benefit but if I forgive them then our relationship is just going to stay the same and they get to do whatever they want. And then I'm left like a doormat, like getting walked all over. When I realized that that's where boundaries come in. Yeah. Like you said earlier, we have to protect ourselves and the relationship does not have to stay the same because yeah, they are allowed to do whatever they want, but so are you. Yeah. And you get to set boundaries. You get to decide how you spend your time and what phone calls you answer and all of those things. And so I implemented those four things and it just, it really just changed. It lightened up all of the, all of the seriousness yeah. around them. And of course this took time and I had to really learn how to sit with some sad emotions. Mm -hmm. And like I said, these are just the myths stopping you from forgiving. Yeah. There's a whole process to actually forgive the person. But when I realized after I forgave my parents and really felt at peace with my childhood and everything that happened, I realized that there was no downside. Mm -hmm. Like there was no downside. That was my last myth is that for some reason, even if we disagreed or agreed with all the other four, I should say, um, sometimes we think that there's like this benefit to withholding forgiveness. Like we get something out of it by having the ability to, but not really extending it. And I realized there is none. Because the only benefits that come from it are me feeling better and me feeling peace, yeah. which my peace, my inner peace is like so valuable Definitely. that I don't want to give that up to anybody. It, it's true. And it's fantastic what you, what you put together, because I know, you know, in, in my own journey, uh, that forgiveness was really hard. I mean, I, I got to the point and, and again, maybe because of my mindset, or whatever, 
but I was so furious with people. I would stay up for ages and ages and ages replaying conversations that I've had with them in my head. And what would I do if I ever saw them again? And and you sit there and the, the good thing is, you know, through various friendship groups and things that people have actually, said, yeah, I did the exact same thing, you know, and, and one guy literally said, yeah, with my own boss, I envisioned getting in the car and hitting him with the car. <laughs> I was like, well, at least you're being honest <laughs> because of the level of stress and anger and the, you know, we, we can't stress enough folks that unforgiveness can lead to some really crazy and stupid things. And you've got to, it is a process and it can take a long time as Courtney's saying, as I'm saying it can take a long time to really deal with it. I've got to ask you as well, from my own personal point of view, when was it that it not only clicked from being a, a, a mental thing, when did it actually click into the internal part of you that said, yeah, I've, I've forgiven them beyond words. I've now forgiven them in my spirit and all about, all about me has forgiven what's gone on. Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, I think it had a lot to do with my feelings. Like mm -hmm. I started really questioning how I viewed my past. Like I just thought I had this story that I kind of kept with myself. Like I would joke with my, you know, wicked humor. Like <laughs> I have mommy issues or I have trust issues. It was just terrible jokes that were kind of real, but yeah. I kind of just threw it out there as a party trick, which was a terrible way to introduce yourself. But <laughs> I started questioning that, like seriously looking at what am I telling myself yeah. about who I am and my childhood? And that's why now I look back and be like, yeah, I was loved a lot. My parents loved me and they did try their best. I really do believe that. Um, they made at the same time, terrible decisions. And both of those things can be true. Mm -hmm. And that's what I gave myself. I validated my experience, but also elevated my story by allowing myself to also see the good and the joy that I experienced and really just switching my story from what I was telling myself to something that really benefited me. Yeah. And so I was able to use that to like fuel my mindset now about how with my mom and like I think that when I started sitting down and unpacking my childhood and really learning how to sit with discomfort yeah. like sit with the grief from not having the childhood I thought I was supposed to or the mom or the dad or the relationships I thought I'd have with my siblings like you know all these little tiny details yeah. that I never sat with and just mourned mm -hmm. it really gave me a lot of room to process the sadness and disappointment and not and let go of the anger yeah and when I could feel it in my body when I was really allowing the emotions to come and not try to shove them away not try to eat them away or Netflix them away like I was really able to process them and really feel them through and I noticed that I physically could react differently to my yeah. mom I noticed I switched from being obligated to talk to her to wanting to talk to her. That, I mean, that's, and, a, that's a really awesome thing. Sorry, I was, I was just going to say, because, you know, a lot of times people almost refuse to acknowledge the way that they're feeling, because like, if I don't acknowledge it, you know, like you were saying earlier on, you can bury it deep, 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 deep. Um, it's going to keep coming up. And it did with me for years. It was just keep, kept coming up, kept coming up. And it was more and more angry each time. It was like this beast that, you know, and I think because years ago you know i was involved with a lot of interviews or involved with a lot of other things i was i was in your seat basically when people were talking to me about these things and it was the fact that i was talking about it over and over and over and over again which for me was the worst thing because you're reliving it constantly and eventually i had to say look i need to stop talking about this as much until i'm at a place where i can actually do that and like you say i mean it changes the relationship so much within you how did it affect your mental health to be finally at peace with, you know, so many of these things? I mean, it was really great. Like, I felt like when I first realized, like, oh, yeah, this is real. Like, I have forgiven my mom. I could say it out loud. And that's what I do with my clients. If they want to forgive someone, I say, okay, let's see where you're at. Like, say it out loud. Because their body will tell them. Like, yeah. I, if they say, I forgive blank for blank. And they struggle with it. It doesn't matter how, if they, it's 0% or 100%. I just want them to acknowledge how it feels in their body. And the fact that I could say it out loud and say, I forgive my mom for all these different things and feel the peace within yeah. me. It was just so empowering. And also I just felt this weight 
lifted off of me, literally. Like this baggage I held on to for years. And all of a sudden, it just didn't define me anymore. It didn't have to be this weight that I was constantly thinking about in the back of my mind or festering over or like reliving or replaying or stressed out about in the future. Like, what would be my mom doing? How would she be talking to me? Or like, all of those things didn't matter because I knew I could take care of myself. I had good boundaries in play and I didn't do things out of obligation anymore. I did things because I genuinely wanted. And if I genuinely wanted to see my mom, then I didn't have to be angry with anything that she did or didn't do. That's, I mean, that's really awesome. And that's a, that's a great place to be, like you say, when, when you can actually forgive and it's genuine and it's gone and, you know, you set the boundaries in place and everything that's there. And that, you know, really helps, you know, building relationships, not only with yourself, but also with those within your family and, and friendship groups and things like that, because it changes a lot of who you are as well when you can be at peace with these things. We talk about relationships and obviously, um, you know, something else that you're very passionate about, you teach a lot on. Um, talk to us a little bit about the work that you do with relationships. Yeah, so I'm really drawn to difficult family relationships. <laughs> I wonder why. Right? I wonder why, yes. <laughs> yeah, I just think there's a lot of power in being able to take an active role in your relationships, really invest in your relationships. I think they're the most important thing that we have. Um, for our life. And I've read all of the, you know, cute articles that talk about people on their deathbed that are like, the one thing I regret was not spending more time with my wife or my kids. Or, you know, there's lots of actual research that says that the quality of life is your, is your relationships. The better and happier you are in your relationships, the longer you will live and the yeah. less stress you'll have, less chronic disease you'll have. These literally impact how long we can live in our lives. And so many of our problems with our family is because one, we want them to change and we want us to stay the same, or we feel like we, they should just know, right? Like read our expectations or we don't set boundaries. We don't communicate our feelings. Like there's all these things that I feel like we're not taught yeah. in school at all. <laughs> and so I feel really called to help people have these tools for relationships that can really, they can implement today, right? Right now, feel your feelings and express your feelings, set some boundaries. And all of a sudden your relationships can really get better today. Yeah. And, and, and the, the crazy thing is, you know, and again, it's one of the things I've heard so often, and I'm probably sure you have as well, relationships between couples in particular, the biggest um, issues that they go through is obviously, sometimes it's money, so that's fine but it's usually other people <laughs> that are outside the relationship that are causing all these issues. And it just makes me laugh because, you know, we've been exactly the same from time to time. I've got to ask you as well, what have been, you know, some of the, the, the most challenging situations that you've had to face as a relationship coach? Um, can you be a little more specific? Well, you know, if it's, for example, you know, if it's down to communication, if it's between a husband and wife, boyfriend, girlfriend, et cetera, et cetera, or like you say, people just not being able to set those boundaries. Um, what is some of the teaching that you will use to, to help them with that? Okay. Yeah. So one of the things I am really passionate about is boundaries, because I feel like it allows you to look at what your expectations are and how you are trying to actually just control other people so you feel better. Yeah. All the, lots of times we just like, are like, okay, well, if they just change, and sometimes we make it about them, right? Yeah. We're like, they can just change and their whole life would be better. Or it would just be so much easier if they just did this one thing, but it's really for us because if they change, then we feel better mm -hmm. and we want to feel better. It's always about us. We're very selfish as human beings <laughs> <laughs> in a good way, but still yeah. it's usually about us. And yeah. so- when there's something happening, especially if people want to set a boundary, people try to use boundaries to change other people's behavior. And they're like, okay, well, I don't want my mother-in-law calling me anymore, or I don't want my mother-in-law coming over to my house. And I'd be like, okay, um, have you told them not to? And they're like, well, no. And so that's the first thing. Yeah. I think that communication is really important because we're just usually afraid of having difficult conversations. Yeah. It's hard to disagree with other people that you love. It's hard to um, not be offended, especially if you have a story about them and who they are. If you have history with them, that's hard or painful. Um, 
And then we look at the boundary and a boundary is about you. So if you are getting a lot of phone calls from someone, you get to decide if you answer the phone call or block the number, right? Like you have those options. You don't get to decide if they're calling you. And if someone's coming over to your house, you get to decide if you let them in your house, yeah. but you don't get to decide that they drove to your house. Yeah. So we got to clean that up because lots of people get confused about what they can control and what they can't control. And, it, and it's absolutely true. You know, it, it's, it's fantastic teaching. And it's, again, the simplicity of it that's there as well. I've got to ask as well, because I was following you on, on Instagram in preparation for this interview in particular. Um, talk to us a little bit, because it, it was such an emotional thing for you and wonderful to see um, when you went back studying and also when you graduated. Yeah, it was really it was a incredible. big deal. Well, I didn't think you'd be bringing that up. Now I'm emotional. Um, <laughs> yeah, I am a first college graduate, which I didn't think at first would be that big of a deal to me, but I um, started my degree and at like a junior college in Southern California. Um, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I kind of bounced around through a few majors. I quit school thinking I didn't want anything to do with school, thought that I would do something else. Then I wanted to go back to school and then I also got pregnant with my first daughter. So it slowed things down. I took breaks. I kept changing my major. We moved to Hawaii. We moved back to California. We moved back to Hawaii. And it took me 10 years to get my degree. And it's something that I put so much effort and time into. But yes, I'm really grateful that I stuck to it. The longest yeah. goal I ever accomplished. It, it's, it's an amazing thing. And like you say, you know, when you get to the end of that, after all you've been through, and you can say, you know, I've now graduated, you know, I've, I've now got this amazing, um, you know, part of my life that's been so wonderful. It, it, like I say, it was really incredible to see. Um, how was the, I, I suppose, how is life now for you that you've made peace with all these things and where you're at right now in life with your graduation and, and just where you are as a person? Yeah, I feel like I... I feel like I'm in a really good place. I've been able to devote a lot more time, you know, building my coaching practice. And um, that's been really fulfilling for me. I did it part-time for a while while in school. And so I always wished I could devote more time um, to my business. And then I really thought, oh, I'm bad at time management. But then I stopped, I graduated school. And then all of a sudden I had way more free time. And I'm like, oh, I wasn't bad at time management. I was just very busy. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, I feel really good. I'm really excited. I love coaching. Um, and then the next big thing on our horizon is our daughter's heart surgery, which will happen in the beginning of 2021. Um, and we're very hopeful. We are excited that the surgery has a lot of benefits that will help her um, with her breathing and her energy. And so we just are really hopeful. And that's kind of time consuming too, running around to lots of appointments. Um, and I just really want to be example to what's possible for other people because I understand what it's like to go through so many things. And I call myself a relationship coach. And sometimes people get a little bit focused on just um, human to human relationships. Yeah. But I think we have a relationship with everything in our life. Absolutely. Um, we have a relationship with our past, with our future, with our child's heart defect, with everything. And so I explore it all. And I sometimes my husband thinks that I'm just like um, a relation or a coach that deals with hard things like painful things, because that's really all the things that have in common. Um, but yeah, I just really want to be an example to show people that like, it doesn't have to define you and it doesn't have to hurt forever. Yeah. And at the same time, it's very valid that you feel that way. It's, it's an amazing thing. And just as we wrap up, you know, what, what are some of your hopes for the future? Um, build a very successful coaching business. I have some goals right now that I'm trying to hit and it's really exciting to just push through. And yeah, I, I really want to, um, build a practice that can retire my husband and hire him full time. That's a dream. Um, and I really hope to build a nonprofit in the future for HLHS kids. Um, I want to give them college scholarships. So 
That is really those are my future endeavors. <laughs> it's really fantastic, and it, it is, and, and such a heart for other people, and for you know, seeing things develop, seeing things grow. It is wonderful, Courtney. Where can folks reach you um, should they want to get in touch and and even find more out about HLHS? Yeah, that's a great question. So I am on Instagram right now at Courtney Given, and Courtney is spelled without a U, so it's C O R T N E Y. And given, like that's a given. Um, and that's where I mostly reside these days. I My website is being um, edited right now. So not available, but I hang out there. And HLHS, there are so many amazing um, heart moms. The community on Facebook, there's lots of heart parent groups. There's also tons of other heart moms sharing their stories. Um, and they all have different things. And that's, I think, mm -hmm. uh, the most amazing thing is each yeah. journey is so different. And so you get tons of different perspectives, tons of different little cute kiddos. Um, you can just search the hashtag HLHS or CHD and you'll find so many amazing families. That is really awesome. Courtney, is there anything that we haven't touched on today that you want to, to particularly raise? No, I think I'm good. I really appreciate interviewing. You're a great interviewer. I love your accent. It's always so fun. <laughs> Thank you so much. And I've loved doing it. It's been an absolute pleasure to get to, as, as we do with all our guests on the show, get a different perspective, a different person's journey, hopefully to inspire you, educate you more, and hopefully make the world a little bit smaller. Because when we understand from another person's perspective, we can understand how they make the decisions, how they do what they do. And pretty much why they do what they do as well. So it's been absolutely wonderful talking to you, Courtney. Um, and I hope to get to do it again, you know, at some point, because I think there's always more to unpack with everybody. But folks, we're really, really excited not only to talk to Courtney, but all the other guests that are on. But I also want to remind you that if you are struggling, if you're going through difficulty and trauma, don't be afraid to reach out. And if you're looking, if you like books and things, my brand new book, The Battles We All Face, is available now at thebattleswealthface.com. We got the, the second edition through the other day. The artwork looks incredible, which was some of my exclusive artwork that we've done for the, the book. It's absolutely wonderful and can't put it over enough. And it's a very, very different style of book as well. It is not a black text on a white background. This is something very, very unique that we want you to use over and over again. And that's available at Battles We All Face. We look at Gosh, what do we look at? We look at anxiety, we look at trauma, we look at dealing with difficult circumstances, dealing with depression, forgiveness, letting go, making the most of your time, the story of the red blossom tree, coping with, you know, this, that, and the other, peace during the storms, and so much more. You will absolutely love it, and it's available at thebattleswealthface.com. Come and check it out. If you've got any questions for us, don't forget to comment in the section below. Like, share, and subscribe as always, because that may, well, that'll help our little business, but also if you share with a friend, it may help them and you never know what difference you can make. Until next time, folks, she has been Courtney Given. I have been your host, John Morris. This has been uh, the Mind, Body, and Soul podcast, helping you find balance in the craziness of day-to-day -day life. We're out of time. See you next time, folks. When we come into this world, we come in with a sense of awe and wonder, believing that things will work out for the best, filled with excitement. We play like children and we enjoy our lives. But as we get older, we find out that everything maybe isn't as rosy as we first thought it would be. Live life long enough and you realize that what once seemed like happy families can very quick turn into Dungeons and Dragons. Have you ever experienced anxiety, worry, or maybe even fear on an insane level? I want to let you know right here, right now, that you're not alone. Everything from homelessness, betrayal by my best friend, abandonment from the people that I thought would have my back. In fact, I've experienced so many different situations. To tell you all would take a very, very long time indeed. But the good news is I'm here to tell you that, well, they've left their mark on me. I've come through all of them. There is a light at the end of the tunnel. And I've got a brand new book. It's called The Battles That We All Face. This book is designed to give you encouragement. It's designed to give you hope. It's designed to teach you, to challenge you, to get you to think a little bit more. The full title is The Battles We All Face, a devotional with a difference. Because I don't want you to just read it from start to finish. I want you to take time over this. I want you to read the first chapter and really process it. 
This book is designed, if nothing more, as I said, to challenge you, to encourage you, to give you hope, but ultimately to let you know that whatever you're facing, you, my friend, are not alone. I want to encourage you right now to not let fear or the past stop you from living an amazing, amazing life. Each page in this book has one of my art pieces in and has been specifically placed there to give you, the reader, an association to the subject discussed. Please don't delay. You owe it to yourself to start rebuilding your life. Life is not over until you draw your last. Don't delay, order today. Life is short, you owe it to yourself as long as you're drawing breath to stand up and fight for the things that you want in life. But my friend, you've got an ally in me who understands completely what you're going through. Have an awesome day, click that link below and I'll see you on the other side.